أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وسيق الذين كفروا إلى جهنم زمرا حتى إذا جاءوها فتحت أبوابها وقال لهم خزنتها وقال لهم خزنتها ألم يأتكم ألم يأتكم رسل منكم يتلون عليكم آيات ربكم وينذرونكم وينذرونكم لقاء يومكم هذا قالوا بلى ولكن حقت كلمة العذاب على الكافرين فإن ادخلوا أبواب جهنم خالدين فيها فبئس مطر المتكبرين وسيق الذين اتقوا ربهم إلى الجنة زمرا حتى إذا جاءوها وفتحت أبوابها وقال لهم وقال لهم خزنتها سلام عليكم طبتم فادخلوها خالدين وقالوا الحمد لله الذي صدقنا وعده وأورثنا الأرض نتبوأ من الجنة حيث نشاء فنعم أجر العاملين وترى الملائكة حافين من حول العرش يسبحون يسبحون بحمد ربهم وقضي بينهم بالحق وقيل الحمد لله رب العالمين رحمه الله العظيم just give me one minute inshallah there was some technical difficulties today Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah ma ba'ad. I just recited from Surah Al-Zumr, which is the 39th chapter of the Quran. It has 75 verses, and it was revealed in Makkah. And I recited the last section of Surah Al-Zumr, which is very famous that many people have memorized, and it's very, very beautiful. It talks about the people of Jannah and the people of Jahannam being led to Jannah and Jahannam in groups. And this is where the surah gets its name from. So it's very simple, very straightforward. But let me just read this section and translate it for you. A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim. Wasiqa alladheena kafaru ila jahannam zumara. Those who disbelieve, they will be driven towards jahannam zumara in groups. Hatta idha ja'uha. Until when they reach it, when they come close to it, the doors of Jahannam will be flung open. And the gatekeepers of Jahannam would say, so Jahannam has guardian angels. You have the gatekeepers. And then you have the main angel who's in charge of Jahannam, whose name is Malik. So these guardian angels would say, أَلَمْ يَأْتِكُمْ رُسُلٌ مِّنْكُمْ يَتْلُونَ عَلَيْكُمْ آيَاتِ رَبِّكُمْ وَيُنْذِرُونَكُمْ لِقَاءَ يَوْمِكُمْ هَذَا Didn't messengers come to you from amongst yourselves reciting unto you the verses of your Lord and warning you of the meeting of this day? قَالُوا بَلَى They would say, yes indeed وَلَكِنْ حَقَّتْ كَلِمَةُ الْعَذَابِ عَلَى الْكَافِرِينَ But the word of punishment has become certain against those who disbelieve. It will be said to them, enter to the gates of Jahannam. It is for you to abide therein forever and ever. So what an evil dwelling place that is for the arrogant ones. So those who are in Jahannam, who are destined to live there, they will be in it forever and ever. Okay, they will not die. Every time their skins, they burn off, they will be replaced with a newer skin. In fact, death itself would be uh, eliminated. It will be killed. Death would actually be given a form on Yawm al qiyamah It will be given the form of an animal, like a ram or a sheep. And then it will be slaughtered. And it will be said to the people of Jannah, it is for you to abide in Jannah forever. And it will be said to the people of Jahannam, it is for you to abide therein forever. 
وسيق الذين اتقوا ربهم من الجنة زمرة. As for those who feared their Lord, they will be led to Jannah in groups as well. حتى إذا جاءوها until when they reach it, when they reach Jannah, وفتحت أبوابها and the doors would have already been opened for them. And our scholars mention an interesting nukta that just with the change of a letter, all of a sudden we have a different scene. For the people of Jahannam, it says Futihat. The doors of Jahannam will be flung open. So you know when you are scared, when you're timid, you don't know what's going on. You're already nervous and scared. And all of a sudden, for them, when the doors of Jahannam are flung open, of course, they'll be taken by surprise even more. It will be even more terrifying. For the people of Jannah, right, they're already anticipating something good. And then from far away, they could see that they're being welcomed. They reach Jannah and the doors would have already been opened for them. They're being welcomed. And the gatekeepers of Jannah would say, Salamun alaykum. Peace be unto you. You, you lived a good life. So enter Jannah to live in it forever. وقال الحمد لله الذي صدقنا وعدا and they would say all praises for Allah who made his promise come true وأورثنا الأرض and made us inherit this territory نتبوأ من الجنة حيث نشاء we can dwell wherever we wish in Jannah فنعم أجر العاملين so how excellent is the reward of those who did good deeds so this is Surah Al-Zumar the rest of the Surah it's pretty self-explanatory. It's a Makkan Surah. So the Makkan Surahs, even by reading the translation, especially with the bigger Surahs, you can understand the message. The Madani Surah, especially the long ones, they have a lot of laws, so sometimes that needs to be explained. But the Makkan Surahs generally have the same theme that is repeated in different ways. The next Surah is Surah Al-Mu'min, which is also called Surah Al-Ghafir. Okay. There are certain surahs in the Quran that have multiple names. Okay, Surah Al-Isra is also known as Surah Bani Israel. Surah Al-Mu'min is also known as Surah Ghafir. Surah Fussalat is also known as Hamim Sajda. It is called Ghafir because the third verse of the surah begins as follows. Ghafir al-Dambi wa Qabil al-Taw Shadid al-Aqab al-Taw Who is Allah? He is Ghafir al-Dhamb. Ghafir al-Dhamb. The one who forgives your sins. So Ghafir means to forgive. Ghafir is one of the names. And there are many names of Allah that are similar to this. You have Ghafur. The one who forgives regardless of how major the sin is. And Ghafar, the one who continuously forgives. Doesn't matter how many times. So Ghafar comes for quantity. Ghafur comes for quality. And Ghafir, on this, uh, at the spectrum, it's the lowest one, right? So you have Ghafir, and you have Ghafur, and then you have Ghaffar. And Allah has many names, by the way. Many of them center around the concept of Rahma, mercy, forgiveness, and so on and so forth. Tawwab, you have Rahman, you have Rahim, you have Ghafur, you have al razaq al wahhab the one who gives, the one who sustains. So many of them revolve around the concept of forgiveness. And this goes back to the hadith of the Prophet where he says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says sabaqat ghadabi right? that my uh, my sabaqat rahmati my rahma has surpassed my anger. Okay, that my rahma, my mercy, it has surpassed my anger. Even when you look at the names of Allah shadeed al-aqab, qahab those names are fewer as compared to the names of Rahma, mercy, compassion, and forgiveness. This surah is also called Surah Al Mu'min because in verse number 28, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the believer from the family, from the household of Fir'aun, who is a Muslim and who is hiding his faith. But at some point, then he speaks out and he says, وَقَالَ رَجُلٌ مُؤْمِنٌ مِنْ آلِ فِرْعَوْنِ and a believing man 
Ali Fir'aun said, Yaktumu imana, who was hiding his faith. Ataktuluna rajulan an yakula rabbi Allah. Are you going to kill a person simply because he says, my Lord is Allah? So this is where the surah gets its name from. This is Surah Al-Mu'min. It has 85 verses. It was revealed in Makkah. The next surah is Surah Hamim Sajda. And it is called Hamim Sajda because it is from the Hawamim series. The surahs that begin with Hamim. There are about seven surahs. And this one has an eye of Sajda, hence the name Hamim Sajda. It is also called Husil because the third verse of the surah begins with Kitab al Fussil Ayatu. This is a book whose verses have been elaborated in an Arabic Quran, the Qawmi Alamun, for people who understand. Okay, so this Quran has been explained, it has been elaborated in an Arabic Quran. Okay, and this leads to another interesting discussion regarding the Quran that is all of the Quran in Arabic or not. So the conclusion is yes, all of the Quran is in Arabic. But then another interesting discussion is are there words in the Quran that perhaps originated from other languages? So there were some scholars like Imam Shafi who found to know all of the Quran is in Arabic because the Quran calls it Quran and Arabia in 11 verses. But then you have someone like Allah Siyuti who's also Shafi'i, who makes a list of many interesting words in the Quran whose origin is in other languages, like Greek, Latin, Sanskrit, and so many other languages. So how do we understand this? Some scholars, Bukhutayb and others, they say that both views are correct. Both are correct in that, of course, there are no foreign words in the Quran. Quran is in Arabic. Of course, Arabic is very eloquent, and this is what the Quran is revealed in. However, this does not mean that the language did not learn and borrow words from other languages, because this is how languages develop, right? At some point, you have dialects, then eventually, when the dialect is very different, then it becomes another language, because languages, they borrow words, and then they learn words as well. So the Arabic language, just like any other languages, it has Lend, it has given off many words, right? For example, in Spanish, right? Aruz, Rosa, and Aruz, La Camisa, and Qamis. Qamis is an Arabic word. There are many words that he has given to other languages. But also, it has borrowed words as well. And he's given an interesting list, right? And if you pay attention to the sounds, they seem very similar. If you listen to the English pronunciation, and the Arabic pronunciation, even after so many centuries, still you could see the similarity. Okay, for example, the word firdaus and paradise has the same origin. Okay? This word that was in this ancient language, when it made its way into the Latin languages, into the Western languages, it was pronounced as paradise. When it made its way into the Latin language, sorry, the Eastern languages. The Semitic languages, when it came into Arabic, it was pronounced as Firdaus. So the Arabs adopted it, and once they adopted it, it became part of the Arabic language, right? And it is a pure Arabic word. But the origin was from another language. Another example, Sirat and street. Okay, it comes from the Latin word Strat, right? And then it became street. And in Arabic, it became Sirat. Another word, kaf and cave, both mean the same thing. Asatir and stories. In Hada illa asatir al awwalin. The Quraysh used to say these are stories, fables in the past. So history and story and asatir, same word. Uh, another example is, uh, inshallah, we'll come to it. The word zukhruf as well. Okay, and usually the words that are four-letter words, generally they are not all of them. Some of them are borrowed words. If they have three base letters, then usually those are, of course, they are not borrowed. Okay, but if they are rubai mujarrat, then some of them are borrowed from other languages. And by the way, even in this day and age, we see this that every language 
they don't have a concept and they don't coin another word for it. They just borrow it. Like, for example, certain vegetables, like they may not exist, you know, in Arabia. And when they get those vegetables or fruit, they just use the same word for it, but they just pronounce it differently. Like tomato in Arabic, tomato, right? Potato, potato, right? These are not the actual original words because these, so the same thing, even nowadays, when technology has advanced so much, all of these languages and cultures and civilizations, they don't coin their own words for all of these new concepts. So what's up? It's in every language, it's the same. No matter whether the person is speaking Urdu or English or Arabic, you know, because who has the time to kind of coin different words for these new things, okay? So just an interesting linguistic tidbit that I wanted to share with everyone. Anyways, Surah Hamim Sajda, uh, uh, is a Makkah surah and it has 54 verses and it is said that this surah when it was revealed around the same time one of the chieftain of Quraysh wanted to speak to the person wanted to negotiate with him okay? and this person he was more wise as compared to Abu Jahl you know, the enemies of the person were of different categories so you had someone like Abu Jahl and Abu Lahab and others would always stoop to dirty tactics. And then you have those who are more, you know, they had more sense in them, right? And they would be more logical with their approach. So one of these chieftains came to the Prophet and he told the rest of the Quraysh, you have never been, you know, in conversation with him. You have never spoken to him. So let's hear what he has to say. So he comes to the Prophet and he says, Ya Muhammad, he doesn't believe he's a prophet, right? So he says, you know, why is it that you are preaching this new ideology, this new message? You know, it's causing uh, division in the community. And if there's something that you want, we're ready to help you. If it's maybe some uh, position that you need, we are ready to make you our leader, our king. If it is money that you desire, all of us are ready to collect money for you and you become the richest person, the wealthiest person in Mecca. If it is a woman that you desire to marry, then it's up to you. It's your choice, whoever you want to marry, and we will have that, um, it will facilitate, facilitate that for you as well. So what is it that you want? So once he finished, the Prophet said, Oh, Abu Walid, are you finished? He said, yes. And then the Prophet said, okay, can I recite right, from the Quran? And Surah Hamim Sajda, Surah Fussilat, had just been revealed. And so the Prophet started reading, Ameen, Tanzeel min al Rahman al Rahim, Kitab and Fusilat Ayatu, Quran and Arabia, Likomi Alam, Bashir and Wanadira, Arab Akbar, Pongla is no. Until when he reached, you know, the verses that talks about the people of Ad and how they rejected, and when they rejected, they were all destroyed, right? When he reached those verses, this person became so scared and terrified. He said, Oh, Messiah, he said, Ya Muhammad, you know, please stop. He was afraid that just like the people of Ad were destroyed, right? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that if they turn away the Quraysh, then I warn you of a thunderbolt similar to the thunderbolt of the people of Ad and Thamud. So he begged the Prophet, right, to not continue because he was so scared. But when he goes back to his people, the color of his face had changed. To the rest of the Quraysh, they said, this is not the same person that we had sent. It seems like this is a whole different person. And then look at the response of this person. And it shows how wise he was. He said to them, look, let him be. Let him do what he has to do. If he's successful, then in his success is your success. Because he is, at the end of the day, one of you. And we are a tribalistic society, right? So if he wins, it's a win-win for us. And if someone else, you know, kills him or anything, then basically someone else did the dirty job for you. You didn't have to do anything. You don't have to face any embarrassment that you killed one of your own. So let it be. If someone else does something, that's on them. And if he's successful, in his success is your success. Because what I've heard is not the speech of human beings. It's not even the speech of jinns, right? And surely 
it should surpass everything else. It should overcome everything else, and he will never be suppressed. And then when he said this, the rest of the Quraysh, they said to him, Walid, it seemed like Muhammad has cast a spell on you as well. You have been bewitched by his magic as well. So that is the story of uh, Hamim Sajda. The next surah is Surah to Shura. Surah to Shura is the 42nd chapter of the Quran. It has 53 verses and it was also revealed in Makkah. Surah to Shura means, Shura means consultation. And in this surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the different characteristics, and the attributes of the believers. The unique attribute that is mentioned here about the believers is that they discuss and solve the issues through mutual consultation. And this is a very important concept because you cannot have an answer to every single scenario in your life by going to a very specific eye of the Quran. Everything, every scenario that is to come in your life has not been spelled out specifically in Quran and Sunnah, right? You have generic verses and generic hadith. For certain things, you need to discuss it with other people. You know, things that come up in your life. You know, what type of job should you get? And what type of career should you pursue? You know, um, even when it comes to a religious type of question, like should you have a school, should you have a masjid, right? What should we build in this community? You know, there's no specific answer. You need to consult with people. And this is so important that even our Prophet has been commanded to consult with this Sahaba. Even though he didn't need to, he's receiving Wahy revelation directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it shows the importance of Shura. And realize when you give your opinion, at the end of the day, realize it is just an opinion, right? Everyone gives their opinion, then the Amir, the leader, he chooses whichever one he wants. And in this, there is khayr. You shouldn't think that my opinion must be implemented, right? And you shouldn't get very sensitive, which is very common nowadays. You give your opinion and it is not implemented and then people become uh, upset, right? They feel offended. No, you should realize by the very nature of this concept, you know that you're going to have different views, different opinions. If there are 10 people in the shura, you're not going to expect the same opinion from every person. So, of course, there will be 10 different opinions and only one can be implemented. Another point to keep in mind is you don't do shura regarding things that are already clearly, you know, in, clearly mentioned in the Quran. Like in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, establish the salah, give the zakah, perform the hajj. So you don't do mashura in this. Should I establish the salah or not? Should I give charity or not? However, you can do shura about, say, a specific charity. Should I give to this one or to that one? Should I go to hajj with this group or that group? Should I go hajj this year or next year? Maybe in these things, you can do shura. But not when it comes to the actual concept. And the same thing when it comes to haram things. You don't do much shura with people. Should I avoid the haram? Should I avoid drinking alcohol? There's no need to do much shura, and there's no need to do istikhara in these matters. Uh, the next surah is Surah to Zukru. Uh, <clears throat> surah to Zukru, the word al Zukru means gold ornaments. And uh, there is a section in the surah which is also very famous, but when you read the translation, you might have some difficulty understanding it. So I'm going to try to explain it to you. And by the way, the word Zukru is also another one of those words that have been borrowed from other languages. The origin of it is an ancient Greek. So we translate it as ornaments or gold ornament. But in ancient Greek, you know, uh, animals that were drawn and that were displayed on the walls that looked very beautiful, that was used to decorate, right? The place, they will call it zoghrafi, zoghrafia from zoo. Zoo means animal, graphy, G-R-A-P-H-Y means drawing. The drawing of animals. Right, so they would have this decoration in the house, and they'll make the place look beautiful from their perspective. It was like an ornament, zuhrafia, and that same word when it made it into the Arabic language, zuhro, anything that beautifies, anything that is considered an ornament is called zuhro, and then eventually it was used for gold ornaments. 
Okay, so it's an interesting word, zukhru. Zukhru means gold ornaments. So let me translate uh, some of these verses. When I translate it, you may not understand, but then I'll give you the explanation, inshallah. Verse number 33 is translated as follows. Were it not that all of the people would become of a single creed of disbelief, we would have caused for those who disbelieve in the Rahman roofs of their houses to be made of silver and the stairs as well on which they would climb. And doors of their homes and the couches on which they would recline. And we would have made some of these things of gold ornaments. And all this is nothing but an enjoyment of the worldly life. And the hereafter with your Lord is destined for the muttaqeen, the righteous ones. So what does this mean? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that basically this dunya has no value in his sight. It is the akhirah that we should be looking forward to. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if he wanted, he would have given all of the dunya to the disbelievers and have nothing for the believers in this world because they have the akhirah. Okay, so if Allah wanted, He could have given everything, the dunya, all of the wealth and everything to the disbelievers. But He didn't do it. Why? Because if all of the dunya and all of the money and wealth was given to all of the disbelievers, then those who are weak in their iman, they will be enticed and they would also then disbelieve as well. So this is the meaning of the ayah. Now when you hear the translation, you should understand this. Were it not for the fact that all of mankind would become of one creed, of disbelief. If it was not for this fear, we would have given to those who disbelieve in Allah, we would have given him, given them everything, their houses, the doors to their houses and staircases and their furniture of gold and silver. This is where the surah gets its name from. Okay, We would have given it to them, but we didn't. Why? So that people realize that, you know, you can be pious and have the dunya, you can be impious and also have some of the dunya. Money in and of itself is not a sign that you are loved by Allah, nor is it a sign that you are hated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is just one of the ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala trusts people, either through wealth or through poverty. If you look at the Sahaba, you had some who were extremely poor and you had those who were very, very wealthy. Amongst the scholars, you had someone like Muhammad bin Hanban, right? who used to sell the beams of his house, of his roof, right? Uh, you know, to pay for food and things like that. And you had someone like, you know, Malik and Imam Abu Hanifa, who were very rich and wealthy. So it is just a way of testing people. It is not a sign that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased or displeased with you. So this is the end of Surah Al-Zukhruf. Tomorrow, inshallah, uh, we'll start with uh, Surah Al-Dukhan and we'll go on all the way until uh, the end of the 26 years, we might even start the 27 as well. Right now, I'll hand it over to uh, Mr. Zaid, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمد الله وصلي على رسول الكريم ما بعد إن شاء الله the next dua is dua number twenty three mentioned in سورة الفرقان الله سبحانه وتعالى mentions ربنا صرف عنا عذاب جهنم إن عذابها كان غراما إنها ساءت مستقر ومقاما the translation of this dua oh our Lord keep the punishment of hell away from us for its punishment is indeed unrelenting meaning very very severe it is certainly an evil place to settle and reside. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned this dua under the last section, the last ruku of Surah Al-Furqan, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala discusses the Ibad al-Rahman. And who are the Ibad al-Rahman? These are the special servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions various of their qualities, approximately about 13 to 15 qualities have been mentioned of the Ibad al-Rahman. 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains that these are basically the pious servants of Allah. Right, for example, some of them, they are those that obviously make the ibadah of Allah. They are those that do not walk on the pride with earth. And from amongst them, this is the type of dua that they make. Very briefly, regarding the ibadah of Rahman, the Mufassirin, they mention two points. Number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has attributed these people who have the above the qualities that are mentioned in the Quran and Surah Al-Furqan as the slaves of Ar-Rahman. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is attributing themselves towards him, meaning that the slaves of Ar-Rahman who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this obviously, number one, shows their special honor and their status in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second, they write that the from the qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of all of them, Allah selected the word Ar-Rahman, meaning the one that is the most merciful. In other words, these people, other than the qualities that are mentioned, their general quality that they have is that the way they deal with people is with a lot of Rahmah, with a lot of mercy, and with a lot of kindness. So these are the qualities of these people. And as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala discusses that these are the qualities of these people, one of the maqsads and the purposes the Mufassirin they write of bringing this dua over here is that what? This is to make them understand that despite being pious, despite being righteous people, they still seek protection from the fire of Jahannam. In other words, they do not become stuck up. They do not become proud and boastful that because we are those that worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will not be punished in the fire of Jahannam. But rather, they have this worry, this concern that, oh Allah, we want to be protected from the fire of Jahannam and they make this dua. So what is the dua again? Rabbana sarif anna adab Jahannam. O oh, our Lord, you turn away and you keep the punishment of the fire of Jahannam away from us. Why? Inna adabaha kana gharama. Because the punishment of the fire of Jahannam, indeed, this is very, very, uh, it is unrelenting. It is something that is very, very severe, very, very extreme. Inna ha sa'at mustaqarran wa muqama. It is certainly an evil place to settle. And an email place to reside. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect each and every single one of us from the fire of Jahannam. Amin ya Rabbil Alameen. Wa akhir da'wana. Jazakallah khair. Everyone can inshallah repeat after me. Rabbana sarif anna adab Jahannam. Rabbana sarif anna adab Jahannam. Inna adabaha. Kana barama. Inna sa'at. Mustaqarram wa muqamam. The meaning of this is, O oh Lord, keep the punishment of Jahannam away from us, for its punishment is indeed unrelenting. It is certainly an evil place to settle and reside. Uh, inshallah, if I remember, uh, I'll try to send some of these duas ready, uh, to those of you who are on our list, and inshallah, on our WhatsApp list, I'll try to send it to you if you want to see them all together. There's about 40 Rabbanas, perhaps maybe even more, but um, these are the famous du'as. So inshallah, when you see it, I think it will be easy to make the du'a and to memorize it when you have it in front of you.